Today's guest is Becky Gowai, and Becky has the most incredibly, really tragic series of events that have happened in her life, and she's written an inspirational book. And people like Becky, we can really learn a lot from just the, how uplifting she is and how she's adapted to a ch very challenging life that she's been handed. Because I think we're all handed a deck of cards and we can play them one way or we can play them another way. And sometimes people play aces, I like to say, or turn in a card and get a better card because we have the control to do that no matter what our circumstances are, I believe. And Becky's a great example of that. And, you know, it starts with a very sad, tragic circumstance when she was in college. Her brother was killed in an accident and then she had children, a few children, double my number of kids. She had four and one had epilepsy and other has autism. And then she had a tragedy with losing one of her children and she had a divorce and then she got paralyzed. <laughs> so a lot of things, a lot of things, but she is a wonderfully optimistic, hopeful, uh, encouraging person who has purpose. And she's just written a new book. It's her second book. And I love the format of her book. And you'll find out why when you listen, it's something that I am planning to go buy as soon as I finish recording this. But it's something that would make a great gift as well. So without further ado, let's get to the episode I recorded with Becky. Welcome to another episode of Living Your Sparked Second Half. My guest today is, she has two names actually. Uh, their, her easy name and her website goes by this, which is really smart, is Becky Galli. And her author name is Rebecca Faye Smith Galli. So she has, that's a mouthful. So we don't want that as a website, do we? <laughs> Welcome. I'm so excited to talk to you. Uh, and I, I'm just going to turn it over to you to give a little highlight of who you are. Uh, she's had a lot of things happen in her life. So uh, we're going to cram in a lot in a short amount of time and we'll just go where the conversation takes us. But I'm really looking forward. I think you're going to really inspire people with the life that you've lived and the lessons that you've learned. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate you having me so much. Um, it is a mouthful. So I, I guess I would first start, off, I, I'm a writer and author now. I wasn't always this. I, I was a sales and marketing gal with IBM. Um, and that I thought was going to be my trajectory in life. But a lot of things happen. And so uh, here I am. That was um, a big job. I mean, like IBM was the company to work for back in the day. It was. It was, it was a great experience. I loved it. You know, my my. 20s were great. I, I will say, you know, I, I lost my 17 year old brother in a water skiing accident mm. when I was 20. And um, that was a, a very traumatic experience for for um, 20 year old. You know, at that, it, at that time in my life, I thought I had the world by the tail. You know, I, I had um, got a scholarship to, to go to a great school and uh, everything was going well. And then he died. And that was the first big loss I've, I've ever had. Was um, that when you were in college, it happened? Yeah, I was, I was in junior in college. So, and so um, you were living apart at the time? Yeah. Because so you were away at school? I, I went to, yeah, University of North Carolina, and he was um, in the other part of the state with my family mm. in Hickory, and he hit a, a piling in the, while well, he's water skiing. Ugh. So he lived nine days. Oh, and, awful. Um, Any other siblings? Yeah. Yes, I have a younger um, sister. So he was the middle child. Only boy. Uh, only boy, as he would sign his name sometimes. My, your only begotten son, you know, to mom and dad. He was he was just a character. And that kid that was president of the student uh, council, you know, he had an application to go to Wake Forest. He wanted to go into politics. He was a leader in church, musician, athlete, you know, total package kind of kid. And it just rocked my world um yeah when, um, 
Yeah, to see your parents go through something like that that changes them forever. I, I and you can't do really anything about it. That that must have been so devastating for you. And plus you lose somebody you're very close in age. I'm sure your little brother, you loved him very much. And uh, you, losing that, I've been, I like to say I'm very lucky in life because tragedies like that, I, I, I didn't have that when I was younger. I like I lost my grand, my first grandparent when I was 17. So, and, and they're wow. older. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, my heart goes out to you. Sorry. You had to go through that. Thank you. You know, it's, um, it was, I didn't realize it until I actually wrote my first book. It's called Rethinking Possible. And it's about, um, it's kind of what you do when you get what life throws at you. You rethink what's still possible. And when I was writing that, I didn't realize that um, watching my parents go through that grief in, in a way, and, and as well as going through mine, just taught me so much about dealing with that kind of life-changing loss because the family of five became a family of four. You know, I went back to college and I, I had people that knew me but didn't know my brother's name's Forrest directly. So they could su support me kind of, you know, let's move on kind of way where my sister was back in high school and everybody lost Forrest back then. So it was much more of a condensed kind of grief group um, and at that time, my father um, got a new job, a new pastorate in uh, West Virginia. So he was in West Virginia and my mom was in Hickory. So it, it literally physically shattered us. We went in different directions. And then we all grieved in very different ways. Um, my father could speak about it very publicly, became a noted lecturer on grief. My, my mother was in a support group and um, kind of healed that way. My sister had very close friends around her, and, but took it, you know, dangerously hard, like wanting to join him kind of hard. Oh, yeah, I hear that. They had to intervene um, in that. And and I just leaned into my schoolwork and my uh, my friends. So and none of that I learned later is none of that is wrong as long as you're moving and supporting and moving through grief and not getting stuck in it. So I, I like to say your, your grief is as unique as your fingerprint. It, it really is kind of how you cope is um, how you get through grief. But um, And so yeah. how long after he died did you write your book? Because um, before you get much further, I'll just tell the listeners that you also had two other life-changing events. Yeah. It's like the trifecta that you don't want to have, right? So you had kids who struggle with learning disabilities and yeah. so autism specifically. So I'm interested to hear about that. And then you became paralyzed at 38 and you're now 66, I think you had said. Yeah. And so I'm curious in that trajectory of your life, how old were you when you had kids? Uh, and when did you write that book? So uh, the twenties were great. After after Forrest died, you know, I got the IBM job. I married the man of my dreams. Our plan was to, and one of our family mottos in my childhood home was, "What's plans possible?" So you know, we had our plan. We we're supposed to have the, our first child by the time I was thirty. Um, my husband was supposed to get his MBA finished at the same time, and sure enough, you know, he finished in May. My daughter was born in June. Life was good. Um, then my second son was born and developed seizures at, at three months of age and had progressively worse seizures and, and also an undiagnosed disease of the central nervous system. They never could figure out what it was, but he actually died at age 15. So I lost him at age 15. Um, and then my, oh my daughter. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so my second daughter was born. Um, yeah, she was in, uh, that was 1992, so uh, a few years after after uh, my son, my, my first son, and she's the one that developed autism, and then my youngest son actually had a rare blood disorder, alloimmune thrombocytopenia, believe that or not, but fortunately, he, uh, we moved through that, um, and he recovered from that, so I had- so you the, have four kids. 
four kids, four kids, I, two boys and two girls. It sounds like I'm, I wonder if you, you know, I'm thinking about somebody who has a couple tragedies like that in life. Well, particularly after your before your kids are born and you're in that those twenties, do you take the approach? And I know everybody's different, but like cherish each day. Like, you don't know when your time is up. Is that an attitude or is it more one of fear? I, I'm sure some people are like fear, like, oh, afraid of death, especially when they're younger, when something like that happens. And so, so how do you, it, it, did you, do you have some of that perspective? Oh, you know, I, I think, um, I think it's William Blake, you know, to kiss the joys as they come, you know, as the time flies. And I think, um, I really try to, the, the more I lost, the more I became aware of the good that was uh, there. You know, yeah. it's just like, once you lose something, it's like, geez, you better cherish everything. Cause you're not sure when it's going to go, if it's going to go. So I hold plans lightly, you know, and try to move into the positive of that. It's, um, it's, Sometimes it's work. Sometimes you say, why do you have to work this hard for life to be good? But, you know, my my slogan thing is life can be good no matter what. And I've had a lot of what, you know, so. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. So, but yeah, so after the kids, you know, that was a lot on a marriage when you've got two special needs children and, and we it just didn't work. And so we, after a lot of counseling, like three years of counseling, we decided, you know, it's just not going to work. And the way I approached it with our therapist was if we're, I'm not going to have a great marriage, I'm going to have a great divorce oh, okay. and I'm going to work hard yeah. for that for my kids. What was the age um, difference with your kids from your first to your fourth? Um, so the easiest way, so after nine days after my divorce was final is when I was paralyzed. And the kids at that time, when I was 38, were three, four, six, and nine. Wow. Bam. And you were still working full time and juggling. I, worked at, I had retired from IBM to take care of my, of my son with epilepsy. They offered a, a bridge to early retirement and I took it. And so I actually, after my fourth child had gone back to part-time marketing work. So I was working three days a week. And I tried to go back after paralysis, but it was with all the kids, it was just too much. I couldn't do it. So, um, so what you said nine days after your divorce, you know, I I'm very interested in how the mind works and I've done a lot of study and learning, uh, uh the coaching, uh, the neuro coaching certification I got, uh, and just reading a lot of books and, the mind and the body are just one really and going through stress like that can really physically affect us without us even knowing i remember when i i found out my ex-husband was cheating on me and if you would have looked at me or you would have asked me i would have been i'm fine i'm fine trying to be real stoic i lost 17 pounds in three weeks and mm -hmm. had diarrhea every day. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't intentional or anything. I, I lost my appetite. I love to eat. Um, I, I, the diarrhea, I've never had that problem. I've never had long-term diarrhea, but it just shows you how much we can feel fine or think we're fine logically, but there's so much turmoil going on inside of us that is right. way beyond our comprehension. And so I, I can't imagine the stress with the kids that needed extra care that you were parenting, working, and then going through a divorce. That is crazy. So do you, I mean, what do you think about that and how the mind, I mean, you obviously had some physical ailments to cause the paralysis. So can you describe what your ailments were that caused that? Because you weren't in an accident, right? No, um, it's, uh, it is a rare inflammation of the spinal cord that affects one in a million called transverse myelitis. And the onset, it's again, one of these not, no cause, no cure situations. In my case, um, I had a flu that became a mycoplasm pneumonia 
which is known to trigger it. Wow. So I had had um, the flu for about a week and then I went in, I wasn't feeling well. They did blood work, um, put me on an antibiotic. I woke up at 2 a.m. with shooting pains in my legs. I went downstairs, to pay the mortgage and get, I called my doctor at that time. You know, your doctor answered the phone in the middle of the night and he said, drink some orange juice. It could be a potassium deficiency. Went back up the steps with these pains, got worse and worse, got in bed, and then I was paralyzed in six hours. And here you're home alone. Well, your kids are probably there, right? And so, right. But you, you have no spouse to help you. No. So I, I had been back to work, and so I had a nanny that worked with me, and so I had her come in. I did call um, my ex-husband, and he said, you know, I'll be there as soon as I can because they took me by ambulance to the um, the hospital. So you and, called nine one one and yeah. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I, I worked with the nanny. I said, I don't want the kids to see me in the ambulance. I want them to go to school and then I want you to call the ambulance. Um, so my nine, my oldest, Brittany, my oldest was nine and she came in to see me that morning. And I said, I think it, 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 it said, I think I need to go to the bathroom and I went to the bathroom. I sat on, sat down on the toilet and I had trouble going to the bathroom. But um, anyway, I had trouble standing up. And I said, Brittany, can you help me? And so she helped me stand up and get to my bed. I got in the bed and that was the last time I walked. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. February 12th, 1997. Wow. So I did actually ask about the stress because I knew I was under a lot. And, and I had... Every single person I talked to about it, and I've been through the transfer of myelopathy center. I've been treated by Dr. Christopher Reeves' physician. I've done everything I can to understand it, and they don't—they don't see that. They don't see that in this particular thing. This is an inflammation that attacks the spine. It's—it thinks it's attacking the bug, but it's attacking your good cells in your spinal in your myelin sheath. It's not even my cord. My cord was fine. It's the the sheath that was affected. So Do you have any feeling in your legs at all? No. Wow. Can't feel or move or stand or use them. Well, yeah. And I think about, I got super sick. I've never been so sick in June when my mom died. And I, I think we, our immune system gets so I, the flu could have been a result of stress, right? That you're going through. And then obviously the paralysis was a side effect. It just was a combination. What do they call it? The perfect storm of, of illness all coinciding at once. Uh, yeah. And then permanently injured from that. So that's just, how did you, what was the process of you coming to terms? Did you keep having hope that you could walk again? Yeah, so when transverse myelitis hits, it's um, one third recover fully, another third recover partially, and a third, the last third has no recovery at all. What they don't tell you is how long you know, you know, before it's, so they, some people, and this is, it's 1997, that, the internet was just getting going. There wasn't a Google. And so you look for people that have had incidents of it. And most of them say they get recovery within six months. Um, I also had blindness in one, another. Op, it's an optic neuritis called DeVix that was in my left eye that I went blind in my left eye. And saw, so I saw the um, Hopkins ophthalmology department for that. And they they said, yeah, you know, there's a good chance that's going to come back. And that did come back. This vision came back. And so one neuro ophthalmologist said, because of the course of your eye, we're hopeful the course you'll get restoration in your, your spinal cord as well. Well, he was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. But uh, so I had a lot of hope, a whole lot of hope for a, a long time. And it, it got to the point, I think that the, the tipping point for me was um, just, uh, 
I was at a spinal cord injury meeting and, and they were uh, talking about um, all the new, uh, the new treatments for spinal cord injury. And the guy was saying, you know, the leading cause of death in the spinal cord injury is, you know, kidney failure or pul pulmonary failure. And, and I'm like, what in the world? You know, I didn't even realize I'd join a community where my life expectancy was less than everybody else's. And something about that just ticked me off that I was categorized and given a, you know, death sentence because of one of my body parts. And so I came home and, and this time I was writing, this is when I started writing to my email. Part of my writing journey was, um, reconnecting with friends I hadn't seen through email, which was a, a, a new thing and kind of share my stories of adjustments to paralysis. And so when, after I had that interaction, I came home and I was just so irritated with it. I said, I will not ch let my life expectancy change my expectations in life. I will not let that happen. And so every day since my paralysis, and I guess it was about 18, 19 months in, I would try to wiggle my right, right as my left big toe. That was the last thing I could wiggle before everything went dead. And that day I decided not to wiggle my left toe anymore. That was it. I wasn't going to try it anymore. I was going to try to pivot and live fully in the life that I had. And I put an elevator in my house and ramps around and got an accessible van and just embraced it because for so long I was doing this therapy treatment um, that one of the um, psychologist at the hospital where my son was, who um, later died, but she said, you know, when you're dealing with uncertainty, you can try parallel paths. And I said, what do you mean by that? She goes, we well, have a hope path and you have a reality path. And, you know, you can do things on the hope path, like, you know, doing your therapy and your supplements and all of the things in case you walk again. And on the reality path, you can, you know, um, put ramps in your house or get a, you know, do plans, you know, for what happens if you don't. So it keeps you active on two different ways. So if, if you're not so disappointed <laughs> if one doesn't work out because you've already been working on the other one. And so I had done that with my son. I, will his seizure stop or will they not? And I had plans in both. And then will I walk? Do I have plans in both? And same for my marriage. Will it be, you know, will we be able to reconcile or not? And that's just been a good um, vehicle for me to keep moving through something when there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, I love that because what that what I'm thinking about when you're saying that is it's like the the dreams that we all have, the dreams and aspirations of whatever those dreams are, and then we have our current reality. Yeah. And I can imagine that sitting in that hope space, although hope is always good to have, you're ignoring the loveliness of the present tense, you know, of the present moment. And so I see you transitioning in that time to becoming more grateful for the present, you know, and, 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 accepting in a way but still having that hope and and dreams part and I love that that we can have two paths because some people get so focused on the future and they neglect what is happening in their life at, at the moment they're not smelling the roses they're not seeing you know it, it, you know I, I think about myself too just this really type a personality go 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 and trying to get ahead and the corporate world and whatever job I had and trying to do it perfect. But I was just, it was always future focus and not taking a breath and getting quiet and appreciating that moment of just peace. So that, that, that I'm glad you did that in uh, very early because that, that must've been a hard transition to make. Well, and I think once I, made that decision, you know, just kind of metaphorically stop wiggling my left toe every day and that exercise. I, I was going to PT three times a week and, and it was during the dinner hour. So three times a week, I didn't have dinner with my kids. 
And it's like I reclaimed that and Ooh. and leaned into that. And I you don't know if you back in the day they had the big boom box and those CD programs where you could get CDs, you know, with by the mail, you know. And so I would have we would during dinner we'd have a classical night and we'd have a funky night and we'd have, you know, and just and my parents always had candles with dinner. Uh, and so I put candles on the table and I tried to really enjoy the life I had, even though it wasn't the life I wanted. Yeah. Well, I think you also have an identi identity attached to that, right? You you hadn't switched to this identity of, I am a person who is paralyzed. I just happen to be, I'm you know, I'm the same person, but instead of this person that had legs and could walk and, and you're kind of stuck in that, that old identity instead of embracing. Yeah. And, and like, I think about uh, your, cause, cause we were talking before I hit record and she's known as chair writer, um, like her Instagram and her Facebook and a lot of her handles on social media. And um, yeah, you've, it's, it's your reality is, and it's how beautiful it has been. Look at what you've accomplished in, in the meantime and what y your kids got out of that too. Can you imagine how, if you had stayed in that focus of just tr and never been able to walk again, just being focused on that and what they would have missed out on. So hallelujah to you uh, oh, that, that yeah. you were able to do that because it changed their lives. You know, and I, I don't, if people have asked me that before, like how do you, what impact do you think it has on your kids? And I don't know that we ever know that as parents. Yeah. You know, because now I think I, I don't think my father was a, a, a great writer as as well as a, a minister. And um, a lot of his stories I have told and retold and they just get richer with each year. You kind of realize and we my sister and I say this, you know, we get smarter every year. Every you know, our kids are starting to be in their 30s and it's like they've gone through the, the 20s thing. And so it's I don't I don't know what they got of that, but I do know. I tried my best to be there for them and I, I hope it was enough, but uh, yeah. And, and uh, we can only control so much of their, you know, I mean, we do have a huge influence on them, but yeah. you look at siblings, like my memories, my, the way I ingested and retain the same scenarios of my childhood is completely different from my sister. Yeah. And so we have, we're our own unique being with our own experiences. We have our own teachers, our own friends, and that plays into the whole thing. And so while we can feel responsible as parents, as a role model, it's, it, you can still have a great role model as a parent and still like, feel like something that, your parent did traumatize you for life <laughs> right you're like what <laughs> it's so interesting I I told you that the the morning fuel book the one that's coming out are just short little stories that have a point to them and I I make that exact point in in one of the ones I think it's June or July where my sister and I have this memory of going to the beach and we dug up this jeep and um Forrest was part, part of the you know he was still with us and so he was helping dig it up and we were gonna you know he I was gonna drive it we had a fight over who was gonna drive the jeep but I mean it was like way down there's no way we could have gotten it up but we all so I I had this big memory of how wonderful it was and 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 you know what a great teamwork we had as children and and so I had these layered memories that were so positive. And I said, well, so Rachel, what'd you think of that? She goes, oh, I just remember we couldn't get it out of the, out of the sand. I said, that's it. That's all. She goes, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> but it's that same thing, how we, we, we remember different things. Yeah. We attach uh, different meanings. Same, yeah. To yeah. similar experiences. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I'm curious, but, well, share your, the name of your book. So people know. Um, it's called Morning Fuel. That's the one that came out on Tuesday. And it's daily inspirations to stretch your mind before starting your day. Um, that's one of the things that that uh, is a go-to for me. Uh, you know, I have, my I have my lemon water, I have my coffee, and I do reading, reflecting, and writing. But 
I like to read something that gets my mind cranked on the right things. And um, that doesn't so, take a lot of time. Right. You know, you know, some of them are just two paragraphs. Some of them are a page. But these are I've been um, writing for over 20 years now, 22 years. Um, and as I mentioned, it started out, you know, a uh, somebody read a bit, one of my dad's columns about the strange infection that I had that had paralyzed me. He said, is that you? And I was like, I'm not sure it's me, but here's my life now. And so I began to recount my life to him email by email. And then those emails became little stories about what I was um, experiencing. And he would forward it to his friends and I'd forward it to my friends and I grew an email list. So my email list now has people that have been on there since 1997. That's great because it's a form of journaling. Yeah, it really exactly. is. And so you've cre exactly. created this history, this amazing journey yeah. that you've walked. And I love that. And it'll it'll long live past the time you're here. I so it became, um, uh, somebody said, you know, why don't you see if you can get this published in the newspaper? So a couple, one column was published in the Baltimore Sun about playing uh soccer with my son from the wheelchair <laughs> and then that led to a, a some more op-eds for them and then a, a column in a local weekly and then from that um the memoir came of those very journals and then this morning fuel is a subset of some of the the best stories that i've told that people have said resonated with them so there's there's a history now of, of these um little stories that have have really helped me get through some tough times and I'm hoping they'll be inspiring to other people as well. It's a great Christmas present. Yes. Because yes. I love the book, Simple Abundance. And, oh, and I know that was a gift for a lot of people and it's just got the most inspiring or thought provoking little snippets mm -hmm. in all around the idea of abundance. But of course she splits it up cleverly into and apparently she took her like five years to write the book, but um, into these six categories. And then the category, she covers two months. So two months of this one category of topics. So, you know, I don't know how you organized your book, but the fact that you can take that book and you can sit down and read a little thing every day to inspire you or to give you a thought to start out your day, which I'm sure is a positive one. You know, that's that's just a wonderful thing. I love that. I love she, that. That was one of the books I patterned mine after because I, I really enjoyed that book too. Yeah. Yeah. And and to think how long it has survived. I think that she yeah. first wrote it in like, I, I know she sent it to Oprah's staff. And so then Oprah <laughs> talked about it. So I think it was first written in the late eighties and I know she's in her seventies now. And then she, re because a lot of the things that she referred to in the world like we didn't really have the internet then we didn't have technology and so I know she republished it in the sometime this this century uh but yeah so I I love it because it sounds like it's very similar that I'm gonna have to look it up and and order it maybe it'd be a good gift for my grown daughters to give them yeah I'm, well, I'd love, I'd love to hear that, but I, I, that's what a lot of people are doing. They're buying them. I've had some book signings where they'll get signed. You can order signed copies and they're ordering a few for gifts, but I hope so, so. I hope it brings joy. Yeah. So what prompted you to write the book? I always like how people got the ideas because a lot of people that listen to this podcast, I think, have ideas that they never act on. And so I love having examples of people who have the yeah. most simplest ideas that turn into a beautiful book that like spread this positivity. We need more of that in this world. And so the fact that you put something that you created that was really kind of simple, but you had logged a lot of this information in email. So if anything, people should just start journaling and writing down their a daily history of their thoughts, their feelings, heck, turn into a book. If you do, if you do that one day <laughs> for a year, you have a book. Right. Yeah. It's, um, but the, this book, um, the first book was Rethinking Possible. And that one was pretty much the story of 
everything that we pretty much everything we've talked about. I had some other things that happened as well. Dad with kidney cancer, mom with a rare disease, all these kinds of things. But basically it was the trajectory of my life. And um, so that was what happened. And the one of the most often asked questions when I began promoting that book was, how do you do it? You know, how do you live a life like that? What keeps you up, you know, when you've lost so much? And they were my daily readings. You know, I have readings that I, every morning I read and I said, well, you know, why don't I share what, this is how I do it. This is what, you know, this is the life and this is how I do it. And so I went back through all of my, my email columns and the stories for my, from my memoir that I thought they either had to inspire, encourage, or make you think that was the lens. It was going to be a positive one or when some of them challenge you a little bit to think about things a little differently, but um, it was really to share what was helpful to me yeah. in a way that I felt um, could be helpful to others. And at the end, they have just like a couple, the titles are really good. They kind of tell you what's coming. And then there's a couple reflection questions yeah. to get you engaged in what you've read. Yeah. Well, I love the... I mean, I think it's really important that our minds are challenged and it's great to be inspired, but if the inspiration doesn't make you think and apply it inwardly, then it, you know, yeah. what good is it in and out? And so that's what I like that you have this. And, and if you treat it as more of like, you know, I love Oracle cards where you, you draw mm. a card and it's like your intuition can give you a message. It's like you read this card and it's like, what download am I immediately getting from reading this message? And so that is what I love about reading something in the morning as a mm -hmm. daily practice, because your intuition will tell, will, will, will make your mind think about what you need to get out of that and how it can help well, you if you're open and, and to expanding. In that and way. to that point, um, I read the same ones year after year. Yeah, my, my because you're in a different place. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm on like 13 years of reading the same book because, and, and, and sometimes I'll make a note, I put what year it is up in the corner. They're all messed up. You know, they got stickies and everything else in them. But, but and the other thing, if I note like what was going on that day, that year, I'll look back because sometimes that brought me a great angst. And then a year later, it's like, well, I was upset about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, such a nit. And then other same things that happened that I didn't really think that much of. And that was pivotal. So it's it just I think it gives you a perspective and an appreciation for how life can be so different after just 12 months. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, yeah, I'll I like actually that. created a course from it just because, you know, and it was just a little mini course that I share with some of my students who are my, my larger program. And it, because it was, there were so many good nuggets in there that I thought, oh my gosh, I should, some of these things, because she had these, in many cases, do this action type of thing. So I really liked it because of that. But I love that because it's so true that you do change and where you are is a different place the next time you read it. And that's very powerful. So I love that. Oh, and you could also, whatever you get inspired by, you can share it. I can't tell you how many little quotes I got from that book that I shared online. And so you're just passing along the goodness to somebody else. And so I love right. that. So tell me, because you before we started, you said that the Pathfinders for Autism was a group that you, I think you said you started or you helped start. And it's been a real, um, I guess, asset to helping you have a focus on something other than being sad about what's happening to you, which I think is important, right? Because we can go inward and get so stuck there. Well, I think it's probably a really good example of what to do with uncertainty when you have to hold those parallel paths and you're not sure if you're, I wasn't sure I was going to walk again, that I was in the early stages of it. And that's when my daughter Madison at that time um, brought home this yellow flyer from a classmate's 
home and said, come, come learn about a therapy that was working for this child. And because of the generosity of this parent, um, uh, a group of us went to the home. We learned about this therapy. Many of us used the therapy. And for Madison, who at age five couldn't speak, she learned her name, phone number, colors, all those kinds of things from the therapy. But the discovery then at that time, autism, 1990, what was that, 2000, no, 1998, um, was no cause, no, no cause, no cure, and the, everybody was wait and see. So there wasn't a whole lot of information about autism. So we didn't get that information from a doctor or a teacher, an educator. We got it from a parent. And so based on that discovery, we said, you know what, let's parents get together and share what we're learning. And that became the beginning of Pathfinders for Autism. So we incorporated in 2000. And uh, and now we're coming up on our 25th anniversary next next year, and and we help about 20,000 people a year um, to deal with autism and find resources. Uh, we have safety programs that we work with emergency, you know, EMTs and physicians. You know, your next patient has autism. Are you ready, you know, to deal with them? Dental uh, dentist and safety programs for swimming. Um, Police. That's amazing. So you, it gave you purpose. Oh my gosh. And so, yes, because I worked so hard on that for the 18 months, it's like, I didn't have, you know, will I walk again? Will I walk again? It's like, no, what can you do for your daughter? You know, what can you do for other families affected by autism? So that became active waiting. And if you got to wait and I am type A too, which is really hard <laughs> You can't go as fast as you want. I do have a power wheelchair that goes pretty fast, but <laughs> I am limited. Um, I have to admit that. I hate it, but I have to admit it. But yeah, so active waiting is, uh, is that was helpful to me. So, yeah, and I hope it's great. been helpful to others as well. It, yeah. it seems to be. Definitely. I'm sure. Yeah. Starting an organization like that and how much that, unfortunately, autism has grown as a... Um, Right. You know, an illness, I guess you'd call it, uh, disease, uh, you know, which parents, I can't imagine. I've been lucky that uh, that wasn't something that I've had to deal with, but I know a lot of people who have. Um, so I, I want to end with a question. I always like to ask questions, but uh, so your a second half of your life and it has de been definitely a lot different than your first half. So like, w what would you, knowing what you know now, what would you say to the first half version of you? Enjoy it. I think I did. I think I did enjoy it, but I, you don't realize the limitations of, of, of wheelchairs, uh, you know, and, and the physical limitations and what that does to your ability to participate. And I did live fully, I'll say that, but I'm not sure I appreciated it quite as much as I could have. But I really don't have that much regrets about how I lived that life. I think I I tried to, one of my things that I told my daughter when she and her husband were getting married is to let your love be larger, you know, to try to have this 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 uh, greater thing that you can put on top of difficulties that make it a little bit easier to handle. And I think I was able to do that with these challenges, um, including my divorce, you know, we're, we're, we're great friends still, and I really cherish that. But um, I think also to, to maybe let go of the control a little bit, to think that you can control so much and, trust more maybe instead of you know, think you can make it happen you know I was a make it happen kind of gal and now it's more like make it happen but see what happens and be okay with it if it's not what you want it to be yeah that's so true that is so true well thank you time flies when there's so many interesting uh, things to talk about yes, I'm so glad thanks. that you came on and you're so inspiring and anybody who has a shitty day <laughs> think about Becky uh, and what she's no. overcome. Yes. More power to you. Uh, do you have a third book in mind? 
I know you're just published this one. You're probably really focused on that. And well, the first one took me 20 years. The second one took me four. So I'm hoping the next one won't take me. But but this one, I hope, is going to be called Losing Without Losing It. I like that. And it's just going to be a little bit more of a, because this this guy is, is you know, a page a day. I mean, it's, it's, it's oh, yeah, pretty month. thick. Hold it up again. I do have a YouTube channel, so I can can share that. That's pretty. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Very I love comforting cover. Yes, with a cup of coffee or tea, yeah. whatever. Yeah, I love that. Very good. So, four years. So you beat the simple abundance person, but that's four years is a long time. Yeah, it's shorter than 20, though. But my life kept happening with the first one. Yes. It, but it's. It works out how it's supposed to, I guess. It does. It does. I bet it's great. So I am definitely going to look it up and I'll share the link. Um, is it on Amazon? It is on Amazon and it's on Barnes and Noble, you know, okay. any your local, I did a local bookshop last week, we sold a bunch there. So uh, you can find it. And on my website, you know, it's Becky Galli, B-E-C-K-Y, G-A-L-L-I. And that is, um, there's a, uh, the landing page there has all the places you can get it. And Becky lives in Baltimore. So if you happen to be close to that area, that's probably where you do a lot of your book signings, right? Yeah. It's really fun when people can meet somebody in person, somebody who's written a book, especially. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inspiring us.